Greetings. Welcome to our show, Ghosts Are Near, where we explore various aspects of the paranormal and paranormal research. I am your host, Keith Johnson, the founder of Near New England Anomalies Research. With me is my co-host and co-founder, Sandra Johnson. Hello there. And I'd like to especially welcome you because this is our seventh anniversary show this evening. Yay! Seven years we've been doing this, and we hope to continue. Absolutely. Congratulations, Sandra. Thank you, Keith. Congratulations to you, too. <laughs> now, in our most recent episode, we discussed The Conjuring that movie which has recently opened about the Perrin case, the haunting which took place in Harrisville, Rhode Island in the early 1970s, and uh, Pyro, of course, Parapsychological Investigation and Research Organization were on that scene as it was actually happening, and it was a 10-year saga of the Perrin family, what they went through. Recently, our dear friend, Andrea Perrin, was back here in Rhode Island and she was at the Assembly Theater in Harrisville, Rhode Island, giving a evening presentation of her experiences in the town where it all happened. And of course, Andrea has been on our show before, a uh, very, very dear friend, and she is the author of the books House of Darkness, House of Light, House of Darkness, House of Light, Volume 2, and Volume 3 is being released as we speak. She's a very busy girl. Mm -hmm. And we actually have some highlights of that evening presentation. And I was honored to be asked to MC that, to give the opening to that presentation at the Assembly Theater in Harrisville. And of course, Andrea, is um, she has a background in theater, and that is her old stomping ground. That is the lover of her life. So she is part of the Assembly Theater. and. The town of Harrisville, practically the whole town turned out and welcomed her, so she is the beloved daughter of Harrisville, Rhode Island. And what her and her family went through, it's practically beyond description. So I'm going to let Andrea talk about it in her own words. Don't you think we should do that, Sandra? I think we should do that, and since I was not able to attend, this will be my first time watching, so roll that footage. Whenever you are ready, let's go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Welcome to the Assembly Theater. So nice to have you out in this balmy evening. My name is Keith Johnson, and I am a paranormal investigator. I'm also known as a demonologist. 
How many of you have seen a recently released movie called The Conjuring? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Just about, I'd say, uh, more than three-fourths of the audience. Yes. Well then, you know the premise of the story. You also know it's based on a true story. Now, a little background on myself. I have been in the field of paranormal investigation for more than four decades. Of course, I'm kind of dating myself there by saying so. But uh, my brother Carl and I did start in the field of paranormal investigation uh, many years ago, before it was popular. And uh, over the course of the many years we've been investigating, we've seen many horrific cases. We've been through quite a few experiences. We've um, been members of quite a few organizations, uh, including the Atlantic Paranormal Society. My wife Sandra and Carl and I have been members of Ghost Hunters. We were affiliated with that, with that for many years. And uh, we also, my wife Sandra and I, have formed our own organization over the past decade. We have run New England Anomalies Research, also known as NEAR. And Carl and Sandra and I have also appeared on the TV series Paranormal State and uh, quite a few other productions over the years. We've seen many things, been involved in many, many cases, some of them hair-raising. However, I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there is one case in particular that will stay with me. It haunts me to this day and it was the first in-home residential case that I was ever involved in. And that was the Perrin case in Harrisville, Rhode Island in the early 1970s. At the time, I was a member of an organization, the first paranormal investigation organization I ever belonged to called Parapsychological Investigation and Research Organization. And we actually have three members here tonight of that original organization. Myself, my brother Carl, and our case manager, Donna. And uh, if you'd like to wait, raise your hands there to show where you are, there. And uh, very glad to have you here. Now, you have to realize, ladies and gentlemen, this is years before the internet, so I, the only way to get the word out, I placed a little ad in a local paper, which I, did, I designed it myself, and uh, I said that we do investigations of things that are unexplained, free of charge, and if anybody is in need of our services, please contact us. I thought it would be ignored or laughed at, which I was used to at the time. It was not that popular a subject. But uh, three weeks later, lo and behold, it was answered. It was answered by a woman named Carolyn Perrin, a resident of an 18th century farmhouse located right here in Harrisville, Rhode Island. And we heard her story. What she told us was beyond belief. Ladies and gentlemen, it was literally beyond belief. Not only what she herself and her family were experiencing, but the very history of the farmhouse, the 18th century farmhouse, her, her husband, and their five daughters had moved into. So we did come to that house and investigated it. And we found out that this was the real deal. Now let me tell you, this family, there was nothing strange or spooky about this family. In fact, when we met them, as soon as we walked onto the property, you could tell something was wrong. There was this overpowering, overwhelming feeling that it's impossible to describe unless you yourself have experienced it, ladies and gentlemen. It was oppressive, it was overwhelming. Uh, you just knew and everybody there was feeling the same exact thing. But this family, the Perrin family, Roger, Carolyn, and their five daughters. This family looked like they had stepped out of a TV show. They were so, they were such a, a beautiful American family. All of them very, very good looking, very intelligent, extremely well-spoken and on the level. The children 
grabbed onto my wrist and gave me a tour of the property. Um, I was their favorite. I think I reminded them of David Carradine of Kung Fu at the time because my hair happened to be down past my shoulders at the time and I was uh, about uh, 30 pounds lighter at least. But uh, what we experienced in that home was our first major taste of the preternatural. We experienced genuine spirit activity and what we experienced that night was something that this family endured and experienced for a decade. A decade, ladies and gentlemen, they were living in this house. This evening, Andrea is going to share with you in her own words what she and her family experienced in that house. What she is going to tell you some of it will be downright disturbing. I have to warn you, some of it will be unnerving. It will be fascinating. All of it, every single word, will be the God-given absolute truth. And the fact that this family came out of this the way they did, the beautiful, intelligent people that they are, is a testimony to the human spirit of survival, ladies and gentlemen. Not that they were not scarred, not that they did not bear the wounds of this, but the fact that they came out stronger people for this. I think they really deserve the credit for this. It was um, my suggestion that we call in our friends, Ed and Lorraine Warren. We were close friends with the Warrens. Now we had discussed this, but when it became the moment when Carolyn was desperate, she was in need of help, of help, it was our case manager, Donna, who made the actual call to the Warrens. So without Donna, there would be no conjuring today. So thank you for that, Donna. I think you deserve a round of applause for that. And I'm going to introduce, at this time, my dear friend, Andrea Perrin, who I've grown to love as if she were my own sister. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrea Perrin. Your Andrea Perrin. Good evening. How are you? I'm great. How are you? <laughs> All right, here's the deal. We'll start first. If you feel a hand on your shoulder this evening, it might not be the person sitting behind you. <laughs> you see, Austin T. Levy built this magnificent theater, and I've had many encounters with him since his death. I was with the Theater Company of Rhode Island for 20 years before I left Rhode Island and went to Georgia to write this story in the bosom of my family, my mother and my sisters, with my father. I love this building. I love it. Before I begin to go on and on as I'm prone to do, I want to ask all of you for your help and this is very important, and this is very serious, and this will go not only out to the village of Harrisville in the township of Burlville, but this program will go out all over the world. My friends, the owners, the current owners of the farm have been inundated with curiosity seekers since this film broke. And I ask you to help me protect and defend them against this onslaught to the best of your ability because it's not just their home that's being intruded upon there's a mass invasion of the entire neighborhood and so everyone's 
homes are being disturbed and their lives are being disturbed. I told them five years ago that this was going to happen and they said whatever comes we can handle it. It's here and it's time for all of us to rally around them and in the way that I protect and defend my family in these books, I ask all of you to help us protect and defend them in their home. It's their private property and they should not have to endure this. They had nothing to do with it and they did nothing but help and support me and encourage me from the inception of this project. I love them dearly as though they were my own family. So please, with a round of applause, tell them that you're with them. Where to begin? The Conjuring is a phenomenal movie in every conceivable sense of the word. It is an amalgamation of a story. Many of you have read volume one, you're into volume two, volume three's coming in a matter of just a few weeks. So you know, I can't tell you the emails, that's not how it happened. Well, you're telling me that's not how it happened. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, but I want you to understand that and appreciate it for what it is. It's a piece of Hollywood. Now, let me clarify. The Conjuring is, was originally called The Warren Files. Ed and Lorraine Warren uh, came to our home for the first time on the eve of Halloween in 1973. And the group, as Keith explained, Pyro, really brought them to us. Well, the group at Pyro had as much experience as they did. And so they knew what they were seeing was real and true. Keith, he neglected to mention that he had quite an experience in my sister's bedroom. I'll tell you what, no, not like that. <laughs> Although it was Nancy, so anything's possible. <laughs> we gave them a tour of the house. Well, I stayed downstairs because I was watching, you know, what was going on around the house, but uh, all of a sudden, I heard doors slamming, windows slamming. Uh, Keith had done something abominable. He'd made the sign of the cross on the screens in the bedroom, and all hell broke loose. Cindy got bashed in the head and had her head taken right to the floor. Keith, Keith showed up. I know he said he looked like a rock star. Nancy came running in the house when they pulled up into the yard. She said, Jesus Christ is here. <laughs> Jesus Christ is here. I'm like, uh, I don't think we matter quite that much in the scheme of things, but I'll go take a look. Um, just a lovely, lovely man. But the thing that she saw in Keith was not so much the long hair and the beautiful tunic and the Bible, which he carried at the time and still has with him at all times from what I understand. But he also carried with him a certain spirit and a glow that radiated and you can see he is a radiant soul his spirit is just phenomenal it's he's my brother he's my kindred spirit and i thank him from the bottom of my heart for introducing me tonight what i will tell you is the greatest leap of faith that i made in the course of this entire project from the inception of the books the greatest leap of faith i made was signing my name to a Hollywood movie contract blind, not knowing who I was turning the rights to our names and likenesses over to. With painting the portrait of our family in very broad strokes, he had no choice. Think about what you've read in the books. There's no conceivable way that they could condense 10 years of experience into a two hour film. They had the Warrens case files, and they had a plethora of material that I threw at them because I wanted it to be an authentic telling of our story to the extent that they were able. Now there are some discrepancies. For instance, uh, we were born and raised Catholic. All of us were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. When we moved to Harrisville, 
we left our parish in St. Aidan's in Cumberland and went to the parish at St. Patrick's. And at the time, um, the priest there was a little nervous about what he was hearing about us in town. And he was warm and welcoming at first, but the more the rumors swirled, the more reticent he became. And at one point, about a year into our tenure at the farm, he mildly suggested that we find another place to worship. My favorite question that I get when I do interviews, which I do frequently, um, is what the hell is wrong with you people? Why did you stay there for 10 years? I would have been out of there in 15 minutes. It's a legitimate question. It truly is. What I will tell you is, and those who have read volume one know, a series of incidents occurred in Cumberland which catapulted us to that farm. What conspired to take us to the farm likewise conspired to keep us at that farm for 10 years. And I will tell you, and you may certainly ask my father about this, it broke our heart to leave, our collective heart. But the last year we were there, my mother said, Roger, I will not survive another winter in this house. He put the house on the market and it languished there for months. I have lived fearlessly from the age of 12 because I saw my first full body apparition when I was unloading the truck and walking through the dining room. And I greeted him. He looked absolutely solid to me. And then I said, good morning. And he ignored me like I was the ghost. I kept walking into the kitchen, big box. Then comes Cindy. Mom, who's that other man in the dining room? And she said, Mr. Kenyon. He was packing the last of his belongings out of the china cabinet. And she said, are you talking about Mr. Kenyon? And Cindy said, no, Mom, the other man. And Mom said, there is no other man in the dining room. And then Nancy walked into the kitchen and she said, you know that man in the dining room? He just disappeared. Cindy's like, don't tell mom. <laughs> don't tell mom, don't tell mom. Well, we didn't tell mom anything for five months until it got to the point where I woke up with one to three sisters in bed with me every single night. And at some point I had to say, you know, it's time to tell mom. Well, we had no idea what my mother was enduring. Of course, she wasn't going to tell us. We were her little children. And one night, four of the five of us sat around the kitchen table and we discussed and the floodgates opened. And Cindy said, Mom, I crawl in bed every night with Annie because I'm so scared because these voices come around my bed. They come completely around my bed. It sounds like one voice, but I know it's more than one voice. And they all say the same thing over and over and over again. And they say it together. There are seven dead soldiers buried in the wall. It was horrifying, truly, to watch my mother waste away. I went into the kitchen and of course it was before microwaves, it was, you know, we're still using a telegraph for God's sake, I mean it was just, you know, what's an answering machine, you know. Um, so I warmed up some beef stew on the stove for it, it took a few minutes, and in that time, mom reached around into the wood box and she threw a, what, the Yule log, the last log of the night, onto the fire and put the screen in front and she heard noise and laughter behind her. Well, I had just walked through the parlor into a completely dark dining room and into the kitchen. And she turned around and she saw the dining room completely lighted, candles on the table, a fireplace that had been sealed for more than a hundred years with a raging fire in it, a woman with an apron and a puffy top um, stirring something in the fire, telling the children to take their place on benches that go to a table that was not our own. And two gentlemen with steins in front of them sitting on the other side of the table. One of them looked into the parlor 
and then nudged the man beside him and pointed, and my mother was the ghost. There are people out there that don't believe this story and never will. I didn't write it to convince anyone of anything. Everyone has free will, everyone. The skeptics are what move us forward in terms of understanding the paranormal. But I do believe that someday, someday, science and spirituality will merge. And I do believe that that's where the answers will begin to come because they are not separate and distinct entities. Everything is integrated. Everything in the cosmos is integrated. And God consciousness is everywhere omnipresent. So I say to you, my dear friends, have faith, believe. fond memories I was thinking was back during our initial investigation back in the early 1970s and uh, Andrea had to go down into the cellar to get some preserves and it was very dark and gloomy very ill lit in that cellar she asked me to accompany her while we were down and we were of course both teenagers at the time while we were down there we felt the presence began to manifest right there and of course you know what do we do so I took her hand and we prayed together and we knew God was with us. And suddenly we weren't afraid anymore. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, now I know Andrea said it very well. We love you, Andrea. Um, but I, I don't think that we can emphasize enough how uh, important it is that um, everyone is courteous and leave the current residents of the Harrisville house alone, you know, if, if you're, um, of uh, the legend tripping ilk and you want to drive by, that's fine, but please just keep on going. Um, Andrea the, said that very well. She yeah. said it very well and uh, that, that would be great if, if you could do that. Um, the footage that you saw at the beginning um, of the clip was um, actually, uh, Keith and I uh, took our son to um, for an excursion to the Bathsheba gravesite, and that's where that um, that no EVP was recorded. Um, do you have anything to say about the no EVP? Well, I do not believe it was the spirit of Bathsheba. It was a male voice, and uh, I think it was a contrary spirit brought in by the negativity because of the vandalism and the uh, destruction that goes on there. As you saw in the footage, her gravestone has been totally toppled over where it was recently repaired very, very expensively. Very, very sad. So hopefully this will stop. And uh, the Get Out EVP, um, that was very interesting. That was caught um, in 2005 at one of our, of our investigations there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think that's all that we uh, have time for tonight. So. Thank you for watching, and uh, good night, everyone. God bless.